Hey everyone, how's it going? Um, you guys already know who I am. I'm Pat the Dentist, and I'm sitting here actually with a good friend of mine, Harris, also known as the Desert Doc. And what we're going to be doing is just uh, fielding your guys' questions, uh, whatever you guys want to ask, same type of deal. We're going to go ahead and we're going to be doing that and uh, just kind of diving in and seeing his path, how he got into medicine, why he wanted to do medicine and, and all that stuff. So um, from what I understand, uh, after going to UCI, you pursued an MPH, right? That's right. Yeah, yeah. So it, even even at UCI, what I did was not the traditional route. I, I was a, my degree was in sociology. Yeah. So I, I took the pre-med prerequisites on the side, but my major was in sociology. Okay. And I think that actually helped. And then that what, created a desire for me to pursue public health. And then I did the MPH. Like, what about was, that, like, sociology degree, though? Like... So sociology, basically, it helps you understand society from kind of like a macro level mm -hmm. and, and the moving parts of society, how education and media, healthcare, et cetera, are all interconnected and how that can change the trends within a society. Yeah. So I like that, that kind of wide scale, like overarching theme because with medicine, it's very individualized. You treat a patient at a time. So I needed, there's a part of me that wanted that kind of well, like overall big picture, big sweeping change as well. So yeah. sociology introduced me to that concept of societal trends and That's changing awesome. that. And I focused in on that with public health and public health policy. That's awesome. And, and you went to USC for that, right? So I went to USC, yeah. best decision of my life. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Die hard Trojan, right? Of course. Once you once you go there, you become. It's just like the resources that they put into their students. The yeah. resources. Just that creates the kind of pride and within you and you know the sports and everything, so it's it's fun and they they do a lot for their students. I mean, in our public health program, literally every week what they did is they would send out internships yeah. and and different opportunities for our students. So we would have you know up to date kind of what 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 are the different opportunities that we have and for quite a few of them we would have an advantage and they would kind of prefer our students oh, over right. others. Yeah, so the USC MPH program is something that I would definitely recommend. It is a bit pricey, but with anything, like you have to look at it as an investment. Exactly. I'm, I'm a firm believer in yeah. that, that education is one of the most important things. Is you have to be like a lifelong learner. Yeah. You know, and invest in yourself, whether it be yeah. reading a book after you're done with school or yeah. learning some new skill or yeah. something about technology. Like, I've got a public health question. Okay. What changes in public health would you like to see in the next five years? So, yeah. Go so, for it. So, one what of what the one of the things I would like to see is an increase in, in coverage for all people. And that's something that the ACA moved towards, but the ACA, I believe, you know, has some room for improvement. But one fundamental thing I would say is, is we need to have people covered. And then the one thing the ACA didn't address was undocumented and their coverage. So, you know, whether or not you're pro or anti, you know, doesn't make a difference. The reality is, is, the people who are undocumented, they don't have insurance. Yeah. And so they have to show up to safety net hospitals, right? And now safety net hospitals. Billions of yeah, dollars. Yeah, exactly. Just in dentistry alone, I'm going to say something yeah. like $54 billion a year. Yeah. So it's medical, medical room business. So it's a disaster because they, they, who pays for that, for that care, right? It, yeah. it's, it's kind of, and safety net hospitals lost a lot of their funding because of the ACA, because the, the theory was that now that you're insured, the pe patients are you insured. Have to you don't need, say, you don't need the money because they'll have, you can build an insurance. But undocumented, we're not taking care of in that. So yeah. that's one aspect of public health. Another thing in public health right now is, is like marijuana, recreational marijuana is 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 it's a specific we're not allowed point. To talk about that. But uh, <laughs> I'm <just kidding. laughs> so, like, so it, it's it's being legalized, right? And yeah. like, it, it's across the board, but it needs to be legalized responsibly. I agree. And so, like in California, when it was legalized, it was something that I worked on last year. Was one of the things that there's many concerns, right? One is impaired driving yeah. as a result. So you need to have money allocated from the tax revenue going towards impaired driving. You need child resistant containers. Yeah. Right. You need to make law make sure that there's no you can't sell or create those products near schools or parks. Yeah. You need to make sure some of the money rev revenue is going towards prevention programs towards research. So that's what we did in California. So one thing public health that I want is moving forward these other states that are looking into it, like New Mexico, which is where I go to medical school right now, is I hope that they also Legalize it recreationally, but responsibly. So it's a responsible, you know, 
insurance coverage is another thing. And obviously the biggest one is cost. Yeah. That's like the obvious one. I didn't mention that at first because it's so obvious our healthcare costs are insane. You have to find ways to, to take care of that. There's interoperable systems. And mm -hmm. what I mean by that is like healthcare systems each have kind of their own net healthcare technology that they use, health uh, yeah. information technology. And it doesn't transfer sometimes over to a different hospital network. So if you're yeah. a patient, you switch over, you end up redoing all the tests over again because you can't get that data. And another thing where we come in is is interprofessional communication yeah. between the physical therapist and the physicians and the dentists and the nutritionists and the chiropractor, et cetera, et cetera. There needs to be more communication and, and, and a kind of interprofessional approach to, to healthcare. And, if, and, uh, and then the last thing I would say just improving the built environment of, of some of our inner cities yeah who don't have paved roads or parks oh, and it's terrible i mean yeah. you look at uh detroit because that's yeah. where i go to school and yeah the, the inner city itself is uh it's it's getting a lot better but yeah. it, it was a complete mess and yeah. like you're saying the roads themselves and things like yeah. that potholes everywhere and yeah it's really about uh building up infrastructure yeah. at the same time there's so many different ways that we have to tackle these types of problems and that's the thing of public health it's it's such a anything and everything almost falls in public health yeah and it ties into medicine too like for me if i have a patient uh, so now in, in healthcare a lot of the reimburse or you get paid from for outcomes now mm -hmm. you know there's more of an emphasis on we're going to pay the physician based on the outcomes but the problem with that one of the issues with that is if if I tell a patient that you know you need to exercise yeah. to, to manage your hypertension or your diabetes, and they don't follow up with that, right? I'm gonna get essentially you could say ding. Yeah. But it's not the patient's fault as much either because where but you know depending on where they live, they may not be able to exercise. They may not have a park nearby. They may not have even paved roads. Yeah. In New Mexico, we see this a lot where there's areas that they don't even have representation. So so you know. What are they even going to do? So they, that's where the built environment comes into place. If they had walkways and if they had parks and access to that, they would be able to follow up with what I'm saying. So it's all interconnected. And I think yeah. that that realization is happening across each field, then including your field, my field. And because of that, I'm hoping that, you know, our outcomes will get better. The costs will go down and that's, that's the goal. And things like this, as small as they may seem, work towards that. Yeah. Yeah. You're absolutely right. What do you think about um, just preventable diseases and, and the cost that, uh, how sensitive it is to, to treat those diseases and basically yeah. how it adds up on, on the back end to total healthcare costs. I mean, yeah. you look at, um, diabetes, for example, this is something that I spoke about not too long ago. Yeah. Um, as of like 2012, we had like 25 million diabetics in the United yeah. States and it costs the U S like in healthcare costs, $245 billion a year. Yeah. And that was in 2012. So obviously five years later, those numbers balloon, yeah. but type one, type two diabetes, right? And 90% of all diabetics are, are type two. Yeah. And 90% of those type two diabetics yeah. are uh, entire. it's entirely preventable. Nothing is, is genetic at, at that point. Type one is genetic, of course, but mm -hmm. that's 10% of, of that 25 uh, yeah. million uh, number of people in, in the country. Yeah. And when you look at like something that is type two, which is entirely preventable, Yeah adding up $222 billion or something like yeah. that on, on healthcare costs. It's, yeah. it's insane. And we have 79 million pre-diabetics yeah. in this country. And so a lot of people talk about how like um, healthcare is really expensive in, in the U.S., but then and that it's uh, so much more expensive per pupil than anywhere else in the country. But at the same yeah. time, it's like when we have 79 million pre-diabetics, yeah. that's more people that are pre-diabetic in this country than there are people in other countries. Entire populations, yeah. And that's just speaking diabetes, like yeah. cardiovascular disease or even lung cancer. Like yeah. I, I want to say 95% of that is caused by smoking. And, and, and so another thing is that with preventable conditions is that, you know, end of life care is, is what takes up like, you know, 50% of our healthcare costs. Yeah, it's just the last five years of life there. It's a stat similar to that. So if you, if we, Come in early and uh, Ramadan Mubarak to you also. Thank you. If if uh, I'm fasting right now and I'm already thirsty from talking, if, so like if 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 we were to, if we were to step in and prevent early, then those massive costs that accumulate at the end would be taken care of. Yeah. So it's definitely in terms of public health, medicine, all of healthcare, it's, it has to be prevention. That's you know, and it sounds like you know cliche prevention, but it that's what it is. It's it's key, and I think it, it starts down at the. 
um, elementary school level. Yeah. You know what I mean, and, and something that we teach kids from a very early early yeah. age. I mean, I kind of just look at like how PE courses are yeah. over the course of elementary school, middle, and high school, and yeah. the stuff they do there. It's a complete joke to yeah. me. I mean, there's no emphasis on nutrition. There's no yeah. emphasis on like the right things you need to be doing. And I think uh, we're squandering this huge opportunity um, of really just ensuring that students run, learn the right things to, to live a healthy life like, yeah. down, down the line. And we need to be bringing different healthcare professionals in, dentists, mm -hmm. uh, doctors, nutritionists to kind of kind of yeah. help them out. But so we got right here this question, how can we improve interprofessional skills? Sometimes patients feel confused because of lack of communication between their healthcare providers. Greetings from Kuwait. Hello. Glad you could make it. Um, so I think one way you can improve your professional skills is learning a little bit about the other profession, which can be as simple as a Google search, right? Yeah. And it could be as uh, even as simple as this is my friend, you, you know, you from from childhood who was in dentistry, and look, we reached out to each other, and, and we're doing something like yeah, this. And yeah. before we go on, we're talking about what are what are some of the similar things we see. How can we work together? So I think just kind of even just researching other fields, like we're looking at physical therapy, looking at chiropractors, dentists. If you're not, if you're if you look at physicians, what they do, and and maybe go to one of their conferences, right? And 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 engage the people that are in these other fields, whether it's through searching or there's through physical contact or over the telephone. I think that's a, some easy steps that can be yeah. done. And and just that having the understanding and familiarity will make it much easier, and then you can move on from there. Absolutely. And uh, schools are making a big push, actually. Yeah. Um, I think the guy on the right is hot. I agree, <laughs> man. I agree. <laughs> um, but yeah, so schools are making a big push, yeah. actually. Like my school in particular, we have uh, when you're third and fourth year, you get to rotate through different different clinics, and one is uh, Detroit Medical Center. Yeah. And uh, there's a whole bunch of different type of of uh, fields they interact with from yeah. doctors to nutritionists to everything in between. Yeah. And I think schools, they're making such a big push because the insurance companies are starting to realize mm -hmm. that preventable care is yeah. obviously something that's really important because of like what you're talking about yeah. on the back end of life. It's yeah. going to lower costs for them. And, and that's a really good point about the schools is that's another huge thing that you can do. If you're, if you're currently in training, you can go to your school and approach them. They can, we get, uh, you know, a nutritionist to come and speak to us or can we get a dentist to come in and just give a you know 30 40 minute talk and, and we've had that at our school we've even had acupuncturists come in and, and just give us a presentation on what is acupuncture you know what it does why they do it and it's just having that 30 40 minute session would it keeps it you can file it in the back of your head it's huge like so yeah. i went to, to ucsd for undergrad mm -hmm. and um on wednesday nights like we have this, so we have this thing called the, the student run free clinics and yeah. it's in interdisciplinary to the greatest T possible. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have doctors that are acupuncturists, we do dentistry, we do pharmacy. Yeah. We even have law because people, wow. when they come in with problems mm -hmm. and um, it's not just one problem that they have, yeah. like there's so many different aspects of their life that might be affected by that, yeah. by that problem if they have to rely on like a, a safety net type of clinic like that. Yeah. And so we really try to tackle um, all the problems that, that somebody has. And um, I think you bring up a good point. It's, yeah. Schools are doing that, and uh, it's it's great. I think sounds like sounds that. like it was like a patient-centered medical home, it which is, like, was, which is yeah. like a kind of a model that I'm sure you're familiar with where they provide like multiple services in one place, exactly. including like psychology. Exactly. So I think that kind of model is, what, is what's going to What's what's happening and it's the way in the future. So totally you got a, a dental question here. What classes should a pre dental student take besides the basic science classes? So could you answer that for me, just for my knowledge? Could you explain just what are the core requirements you have to take in general, also in addition to that? For for dentistry? Yeah. Oh man, okay. Well so for, for dental school, obviously you gotta take the basic sciences, but yeah. then every school more or less is, is somewhat different. Okay. Um, they have their own specific requirements, like some schools require you to take psychology. So I would definitely yeah. recommend that you go online and you take a look at like what the requirements are for the particular school uh, because they have some, some weird things like that. But then also you gotta take labs, OCHEM mm -hmm. lab, um, Gen Chem lab, mm -hmm. and then a couple of bio labs after that. But um, yeah, so what I would say to take aside from just like those uh, recommended or those required courses, um, something that you're passionate about, like like we mentioned earlier, you got to be a lifelong learner, but you got to be doing things, pursuing things that you really want to, to learn. So dabble in some of those things. 
but also at the same time, um, I studied econ in undergrad. And so that kind of, uh, I, I went like uh, a public policy kind of route and to, to a certain extent through econ along with some other stuff that econ yeah. affords. And so um, learn some finance, learn, take some public policy courses, something that allows you to, to understand the field that you're going into more than just like the actual work of, of, of what you think a dentist does or a doctor does because everything is so interconnected. You want to be able to understand how um, markets might affect that field or or something that's happening on the other side of the world or, uh, could potentially affect that field that you're going into. And I think if you're taking courses that um, are not just dentistry related or science related, it's going to give you a complete different perspective on, on everything in life. And you're going to be coming and, and tackling problems that you have in a completely, excuse me, in a completely different way. So I think that's that's something that you should consider. Yeah, I and I think if we were to take that question in in, in medicine, I would say I would agree 100. percent So I think sociology, public health, finance, and econ class in economics, these things are only going to help. And that for for medicine, I would even say, or even for dentistry, epidemiology, also understanding how that works. Yeah. And because for me, I mean, those extra classes is what is, I can already tell they're already helping me understand a lot more in, as, as opposed to some of my peers who don't have that public health background. Yeah. Some of the, the in, in regards to patient follow up and adherence to treatment, public health can really help you understand why is it that certain things happen with your patients? Why can't they follow through, follow up with some things? You know, how, what you should advise them to do based on where they live. Yeah, and, and based on where they live, what are some things you should be looking out for, you know, based on their job, what kind of conditions might they get in the future? I agree. You know, and you can see, you can, you can tell some, some of your patients might not have arthritis right now, but due to where they work or the kind of area that they're working in or where they live, they might get arthritis based on their job. They might be sitting a lot or, or on their knees and in rural areas. So it, it, they might be exposed to, you know, they might have lung problems if their kids are raised by freeways. Yeah. So something like that, it, it seems like, you know, no one thinks about that, you know, so. But everything is just so tied together. Yeah, know? exactly. The way technology is so rapidly just moving forward, yeah. it, it really allows us to break everything down and truly understand what yeah. contributes to a problem. And yeah. so I think that's great for us because it allows us to, to understand how to, to tackle these challenges yeah. even better. And I think the, the core message that I guess what we're saying is you take courses in field that you may think that you think may not be related, but there will be connections, right? I feel, I feel like we're both saying that yeah, at the end absolutely. of the day and make those ties, you know, when you're taking the class, make draw the connections wherever you can. Yeah, that's that's such a big point right there. Yeah. So um, I know you, you've you been to, to Washington, D.C. a few times yeah. uh, to lobby. What, what were some of the things that you talked about? Why why yeah. did you decide to, to kind of do something like that? So so for me, it goes back to the, the MPH program at USC and, and mm -hmm really inspiring me and, and you know creating a, a kind of fire within me to pursue policy and I see that as, a, as an effective way to improve our nation's health yeah. so one, one of the things that, that I worked on was I went with the the dean and some of the representatives from our school and we wanted to protect funding for community-based residency programs yeah so you know in, in, in the U.S. like you know after you train as a physician as a medical student you become a physician you have to get dual into residency, which is three to seven years, depending on which field you want. Yeah. So in in terms of residency, there's been a cap mm -hmm. on on funding for residency <laughs> for some time, and because of that, the residency spots have not been increasing as much as we would like. I didn't know that. Yeah. So so community. So then you have community health based residency programs like teach. It was called THCGME, okay. Teaching Health Center Graduate Medical Education. So that funding was up for reauthorization. And we wanted to make sure that that funding is secured because yeah. through that type of graduate medical education program is where a lot of primary training, primary care yeah. training happens, which in the United States, primary care is especially affected right now. And it's going to get only worse for the foreseeable future. So well, that was one of the things that I worked on. Another thing I worked on was on, on federal caps on the loans. The, mm -hmm. the caps were at like, like 10, 12 percent. And it's all, you know, it sounds like it's crazy, but the point is, is that I, we wanted to, to limit or lower the cap in terms of how much interest the federal government can charge students yeah. who take loans because that's another issue is, is medical student debt which is like on average like, I think a quarter million dollars debt that's it and and I'm coming out half a million dollars yeah debt, like. so oh man so it's a disaster so yeah. so those kind of things you know we're advocating for also the opioid crisis people are working on on things 
related to the naloxone and and get and training you know first responders on on these drugs that that will save people from an opioid crisis. So it's various things like like that is some of the, some of the projects that I worked on this year in in our state of uh, New Mexico. I worked on legislation that would grant our students mm -hmm. a loan forgiveness. So in exchange for practicing in a rural area, they would get their loan forgiven. Yeah. And another thing I, I assisted with was establishing a, a database for neurological disorders, which is related to epidemiology. So if you can kind Seems of like you're just killing it, man. No, you're doing everything. everything. I it's love just, that. I like that. And I think that's it. well, it, it's whatever you know. I'm doing what I am, but. I think it's another point that we should come maybe discuss is sometimes people think if you go to dental school or medical school, your life is over. Oh yeah. And not the case because I have friends that have kids, two kids in, in my program, right? The kid, people have three kids. Uh, people are doing extracurriculars like I am. People are still traveling. It's a matter of time management. It, that's it what changes. It totally is. I mean, yeah. the, the way I look at it is like, you only really need seven hours of sleep. Yeah, and, and make sure you get seven hours of yeah. sleep. Don't be a tough guy. Yeah, and sleep less than seven hours. You think that helps? Yeah, because it's not because yeah. science has already shown that like if you're sleep deprived, yeah. um, it's actually safer if you drink and drive than yeah. if you're like if you haven't slept for like twenty four hours. Yeah, that's wild. Well, that's totally insane to me. Yeah, but I mean the way that I look at it is there's twenty four hours in the day. Yeah, you only need seven hours of sleep. So what's that? That gives you. 17 hours left over right there. Yeah, yeah. You go to, to work or to class or something, yeah. 10 hours a day. So that's seven hours that you have now yeah. to do anything else that you want, yeah. to study, to go to the gym, to cook, to do things that you're passionate about. Yeah. And so it all comes down, like you said, to time management. I mean, yeah. if you can just figure that out, then you're going to be set. You're going to be solid. You're going to be doing everything you want to do and, and nothing's going to be stressful. But, yeah. uh, so I got a question about period ontology. Uh, Zora, I'm gonna have to ask you to kind of clarify, like what what exactly would you would you like me to to talk about that? Um, but I uh, I know you're the biggest Laker fan ever, so please, like, you, this you know it's gonna be you know there's gonna be a Kobe um, Bryant conversation coming uh, up at some point. Yeah. So so I mean, in in my humble opinion, he's the greatest. <laughs> You can be, and I have to, I have a couple of points that I can present for why he's the greatest. Do it because I, I agree one hundred percent. So so one of the things is, look at Jordan's teammates before and after Michael Jordan. They were champions before yeah. and after. Dennis Rodman won rings before him. Kerr won rings after. Pippen almost took that Bulls team to the finals without him, and they almost yeah. took a Blazers team to the finals yeah. also, it's, which it's ironically Kobe stopped. And then <laughs> you, so you look at the players he had; those guys were champs. They didn't. They didn't. Tony Kuglitz had a great career after uh, in with Milwaukee after Jordan as well. So he had players who, who were independent of him were great. Kobe elevated the level of his teammates. Pau Gasol didn't win a playoff game before he came to Kobe. Yeah. Look at our 2010 championship team. Yeah. Lamar Odom, Shannon Brown, Derek Fisher, Jordan Farmer, Sasha Vujicic. These guys were out of jobs yeah. within three years. Yeah. And Kobe took these guys to back-to-back -back rings. Yeah. And look at what happened to Ariza's career. Ariza was supposed to be an all-star. Yeah. And... Uh, you got all the way from Iraq. Ah, how's it going? And, Glad you could join in. And so he carried people who had no business winning back-to-back -back titles. He took yeah. them to back-to-back -back ships. Andrew Bynum, come on. I mean, he made Andrew <laughs> Bynum into a killer. And after Andrew Bynum left, he was getting perms and he was like, <laughs> like, uh, like uh, some type of clown on the bench, man. Right? So, so that's one. Another reason is Kobe, the, the time he played, and Kobe played in multiple eras. He played in the 90s where you couldn't collapse, right, the Jordan yeah. rules. And imagine if Kobe played in a time where you couldn't collapse defense like Detroit Pistons and Celtics. Yeah. What they would do is they would one-on-one -on -one Kobe, but then they would have three defenders waiting in the back. Yeah. That was illegal in Jordan's era because you couldn't play zone. Yeah. But then Kobe played through the zone era era, and then he played through the analytics era. He played in three eras and dominated. Yeah. And he played through so much more instability, man. And uh, where am I from? I'm from uh, Southern California. We're, we're in Rancho Cucamonga right yeah. now in SoCal, but... Uh, he goes to medical school in uh, New Mexico. Yep. So I'm all the way out in Detroit, like you know, he's in New Mexico. And and that's another point is that you can go out of state for training, you know, to different I think states. it's crucial. And it's a good experience. Like yeah. It puts you in a, in a unique environment that allows yeah. you to kind of learn about yourself because you don't have anyone there from home. Like, yeah. you have to do everything on your own and yeah. adapt. And I think that's, that's crucial for people to really, to really do something like that. But hello from Mexico. So... Uh, Zora was saying scope all around in regards to period ontology. 
Um, well, basically, I believe perio is super important for for dentistry because you got to look at first what what perio is. I mean, that's that's the supporting structure of your teeth, uh, the bone that supports the teeth, uh, the the gingiva, the gums, the, all the tissue in there, super crucial. So if if we don't have periodontal peri periodontist or we don't focus on on the support of, of your actual teeth, that's something that's not gonna be good because you look at the way a house is built, it has all the framework on the inside to support all the pretty stuff that that you see aesthetically on, on the outside of the house or the inside of the house when you walk around. And that's kind of how I look at, at Perio to be. Uh, you have to support the foundation. You have to really uh, take care of that type of stuff because if not, your teeth are gonna get loose, they're gonna fall out. And there's so many different things uh, that you might not even think that affect the, the foundation from uh, preventable diseases like diabetes. That's a huge thing. Or even smoking cigarettes. I mean, uh, you might not necessarily get cavities from, from smoking cigarettes, but it's going to destroy the foundation of, uh, of your teeth that, and they're going to get loose. You're going to have to pull them out. And there's just a huge wide array, wide array of problems if you don't focus on something like that. So I think everything in dentistry is, is unique in its own way and everything has its own importance. And I think it's uh, it's up to to dentists as a whole to really work well with uh, their specialists because everything's interconnected. And um, you can't just focus on, on the beauty of the teeth, on the aesthetics of the teeth. Like there's uh, something, I, I think it's actually ridiculous. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, don't, I don't know the exact company it is, but um, every time I'm on YouTube doing whatever it is that that I'm looking up, uh, I see like these ads that pop up mm -hmm. of this this guy who's like, if you have healthy teeth, beautiful teeth, this isn't for you. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, well, I want to see like mm -hmm. what this is, because um, this guy's a dentist. He's mm -hmm. trying to sell something, and he's mm -hmm. already sounding kind of sketch. Mm -hmm. And um, so basically, what it is, it's like this retainer that's uh -huh. custom made, um, and it's just teeth that you basically put on, like you mm -hmm. put on like vampire teeth or or something like that. Um, for Halloween, but this is something to make your teeth look aesthetically pleasing. Mm -hmm. Whether you have like teeth that are shifted in a weird direction mm -hmm. or just completely bombed out missing teeth or discolored or mm -hmm. cavities all over. And, and I'm like looking at it, I'm like, no, this is terrible. I understand mm -hmm. people want to have like nice teeth or something, mm -hmm. but this is basically putting a band aid on a larger problem. Because yeah. the thing is, like, if your teeth look like that, you probably have some type of underlying condition that mm -hmm. is causing that. And so if you're putting a Band-Aid on by just putting like this custom made thing so you can take mm -hmm. a photo, I, I get that. But at the end of the day, you have to address yeah. the problem because you're going to have to get those teeth pulled out. You're going to have to get something yeah. uh, that's just more drastic and extreme yeah. down the line. And I, I think that's wow. ridiculous. That's, that's ridiculous and hilarious. I, I, yeah, I think it's, it's funny. I mean, and to me, it looks fake. Like you look at, I, they showed like before and after pictures, and I was like, "Come on, man! It looks like chiclets." Like, like, <laughs> yeah. whatever. I mean, everyone's trying to make money, so yeah. I, I get it. So, so Z Zara has asked me what medical school I go to. I go to Burrell College at New Mexico State University. Um, it, I went there for a few reasons, including the weather and the food. Yeah, and mostly because. The the public health department is not as developed, so I, I saw that there's a lot of opportunity there to, to work on their public health using the skills that I have. And they emphasize kind of rural underserved care, Hispanic populations, which demographics are similar to where I'm from in California, Inland Empire. So those are some of the reasons why I decided to go there over a couple other programs that I was looking at. Yeah. Okay, cool. And it's good. So, so I think we'll probably do this for like another 10 minutes. Yeah. Uh, it's almost been about half hour or it's 15. We'll cap it out at like 45 minutes. But um, yeah, uh, any good master's programs after bachelor's I can join to. Um, yeah, I mean, there are good ones all over the, all over the country. Um, I know, uh, just got to look it up. You know, I don't really know the ins and outs of master's program. That wasn't something that I did. So I don't want to give you uh, the wrong answer as to what's a good one, what isn't a good one, but I'll uh, just do your research and um, you're you're gonna find something great because um, I was I was so um, I had a couple of students in my MPH program that were dentists yeah. from overseas and then they did an MPH program, which is a master's in public health to get more competitive and they were able to match into residency. That's a good point, right so there. Maybe maybe a master's in public health 
uh, and then, or you, so if you don't want to develop your external skills, if you can also do like a master's in, in hard sciences. Yeah. So that once you start like dental school or medical school, you kind of have a leg up. Yeah. You can do that, but I don't think I wouldn't do that. I would get a, you know, an MBA or something in healthcare or a master's in public health because I think you get more skills from that. You're investing yeah. money into it, you know. Well, in, in particular, I know some schools, they, they have like a, this kind of joint program where if you get a, a post back or a master's like through them, then you can get filtered into into that respective program. So look into that. That's something that's very important um, because I mean you're trying to get into dental school, I assume. So you do want to to focus on on some things that are that'll help you get in that way. Um, but yeah, so New Mexico. What has better Mexican food? New Mexico or California? Southern California. California. Cal California. I love New Mexico. I I I, I that state is always going to be you know, dear to me, but California is, is in my opinion, the greatest state I in agree. human history. I agree. Yeah. So I make that statement. In human history, it's the greatest state. And I can I can argue about this for hours. Oh, I know. I can, yeah. I can say the same thing to anyone who, who, who doesn't even live here. But I have so many classmates yeah. who, uh, they'll come and they'll visit uh, California yeah. for whatever, whatever break we have. And yeah. they're just mind blown. They're like, I want to move here. And I'm like, Oh man, just more and more people keep moving. Yeah. That's insane. Like, that's why it's so overly expensive to live here. It's unreal. The traffic here is, is the worst. I'm like, rooting yeah. for Elon Musk, like, leads us both to build these tunnels yeah. underground so we can just shuttle people quicker yeah. everywhere and not have to sit in traffic. They have to, they have to. They have for an to. hour just to get to, yeah. to freaking, uh, like, Rolling Heights or something yeah. like that in Disneyland. And so, something like that, even, right? It seems like it has nothing to do with healthcare, but it has everything to do with it's healthcare. Totally that. Because some people they can't afford the cars, they need public transportation to make their appointments. So I mean, it's everything always comes back. You you can make the ties wherever you want, even in totally. sports. Totally. Like, obviously, there's so many ties in sports. It is. You can yeah, you're absolutely the, right. You can make the ties. You can, if you want to, you can make connections and learn from every experience. I want to ask you this because um, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe you know this. Maybe you don't. But I had a lot of people ask me about how to become like a team dentist for a sports team, and so mm -hmm. I spoke about that in the past, but. Tell me how you can become like a, okay. a medical doctor, just anyone related in, to, to medicine for a like yes. sports team. Sports yeah. medicine doctor. So if you so if you want to do if you want to be like a team doctor for a sports team, I would I would say obviously do your research. But from from my understanding, is you would do a family medicine residency mm -hmm. and then a fellowship in sports medicine, or you can do like phys PM and R physical. Uh, what is the M? I forgot what the M is. PM and R is another yeah. sports related field. And then you could do orthopedic surgery. You could be yeah. an orthopedic surgeon and, and work also Doesn't for sports uh, teams. Matt Salas' dad? Matt yeah. Salas' is, yeah, Matt yeah. Salas dad is the is a family med who did a fellowship in, in sports med. Okay. And he's like a team doctor for local sports. So when you're in medical school, you can what you can do is you can try to link up with the team doctors at your university. Right? Like at our school, New Mexico State has a bas D1 basketball team, D1 football team, yeah. et cetera. So, you know, whatever sports team you have, you can kind of, shadow the team doctors and get yeah. that experience while you're in medical school and and i would say that's one thing to do and over summer shadow sports docs and then yeah, it's and all about networking yeah networking, networking is networking huge like, in, in that yeah uh so have i tried any good middle eastern food since i'm from detroit yeah dearborn's got a lot of <laughs> great food a lot of great food um so yeah i mean i i definitely have i love eating food from different parts of the world at least try it once uh because everything's unique I really want to try like some some Thai type of food that's like um, not like traditional Thai food, but like the bug stuff that they eat. Oh, like, that's yeah. You you can have that. Yeah, I'm good. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I always see that that type of stuff on mm -hmm. on TV, and I always think it's the like craziest one, most interesting thing. Yeah, like cockroaches and stuff. Yeah, why not? Like I'll try it once. I, I can't. Do I don't them. think cockroaches is something people eat. But, yeah, um, but I, who knows? I mean, it's all socialization anyway, right? Right. Yeah. Socializing. That's I mean, what to doing. them, it's normal eating that. To us, it's, it's a psychological thing. But I just can't get over the. <laughs> yeah, that, that is a lot of oh, no, no, block right there. Okay. Yeah. So people eat a snake. I've actually had alligators. Really? Yeah, at um Outback uh, Outback World or Bass Pro Shops, they have like this. Uh, this restaurant there and mm -hmm. I had like alligator appetizer. It's delicious, man. I'm, I'm sure a lot of it's good too. Yeah. 
It's just hard to get over the the, the psychology of it, dude. It's just, I agree, uh, man. I agree. So, what else? Uh, how long are you are you back in town for? So I'm here. I'm here until August. So after first year of medical school is the best time to do research. Yeah. So I'm doing research right now. I'm doing going back to marijuana i'm doing the public health effects of recreational marijuana legalization yeah. something that interests me i want to see what have you kind of found so far so 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 far what we're doing is we're identifying key variables so child usage rates i want to know how many youth are using marijuana now yeah. in the states that have legalized it for some years i want to know about the driving impaired centers how many accidents are having happening due yeah. to marijuana intoxication i want to know about research funding uh Prevention programs, funding for those. I want to know about addiction. Ten percent of people who use marijuana get addicted. Yeah. I want to know if that's those numbers are increasing and decreasing. So those are the variables that we're going to look at. We're going to contact the public health departments of like Oregon, Washington, Colorado, etc. States that have had it legalized for some couple of years, so they yeah. have the data. And then we're going to compile the data this summer, and then we're going to write a paper on what we find, and and so it'll give us an early that's indication awesome. of yeah. So so that's. That's basically it. And then I'm going to do some shadowing, perhaps, in, in a clinic in Riverside. Uh, okay. Maybe shadow a pediatrician. I don't know what field I want to go into yet, but... Have you thought about anything, or just kind of just... Uh, it's so I'm Keeping it's, doors, keeping the options on the table. Yeah, I'm, I'm keeping it on the table, because, you know, in third year, you do, you do rotations, and I'm sure you guys do the same, yeah. where you we go, you know, kind of six to eight weeks in every... in surgery, pediatrics, emergency medicine, family medicine, internal, and so then I'll see what their lifestyle is like and based on that i'm going to decide because for me lifestyle is very important you know, yeah, i yeah, think yeah. of the millennial doctor the dentist or physician physician it's lifestyle is more important to us oh yeah and absolutely. we're not willing to you know become kind of slaves to the system yeah I agree. because it doesn't benefit the patients if if we're sleepy hungry you know pissed off that's not good for anyone yeah so i think i'm gonna a lot of it's going to be based on lifestyle and, and what's better for me and absolutely that's um, so we got a question. Uh, what is the average age of students in both of your schools? So um, my incoming class, so I'm starting my third year. So when I first started, uh, the average incoming age was, I think, 24, 24 years old. So uh, you can do the math in regards yeah. to that. But So our average, I'm not sure what the average is. I want to say, I can look it up and find it, but I think it might be 26 or something, 25. Yeah. And we, but we have students who are 20. We had a student who started at 21. And all the way up to like I see the that 40s. Were 20. Yeah. They were 20 years old when they started. Wow. That's wild to me. And so in their 40s, too, we have people in their 40s that had other jobs for yeah. decades and had Same families. Here. So it's all over, it's for everyone, man. You can do it whenever you want. Yeah. The age is not a limiting or enabling. And it shouldn't be. It no. definitely shouldn't be. So if you're worried about that, like just like Harris said, just don't, don't put that block on yourself just because you may be older than. An average student, you know, it doesn't matter. Everyone's got a different pathway in life to to get to wherever it is that they want to get. So, but man, that's uh, it's good. I love doing this with you, man. Yeah, it's like, fun, man. It's a good time. So, it's a pretty strong base. Huh? I guess. I mean, soldiers. Yeah, I guess that's what we're trying to do. I, yeah. I definitely want to be doing this a lot more in the future. Yeah. Because just bringing in people from um, all over, you know, yeah. all different types of specialties. Um, you name it, like. We'll be doing stuff with nutrition in the future, and yeah. I'm actually launching uh, a YouTube channel pretty soon, and we're recording this right now. We're on Facebook Live also, um, and we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna upload it from there onto YouTube in, in the next couple of days, and uh, really get the ball rolling on this type of thing. I think it's it's super yeah. important to just have people sit down and talk about this. Yeah, so I agree. Yeah, it, so. it, it, uh, it goes. It a funny comment there. Uh, well, okay, well. That's that's cool. <laughs> and and and, uh, and Zara, don't uh, be paranoid about twenty four. That's like that's I started like, when I was twenty four. Right. I'm I'm twenty six right now. I'm so. twenty five. I started on twenty four too. Yeah. So it's, don't it's completely normal. Don't even worry about it. Like I said, twenty four was the average age. So yeah. I have people that were twenty years old and all the way up to like close to forty and everywhere in between. So a lot of my close friends at, at school, they're twenty seven, twenty eight when they started. No. So who really cares? You know, it doesn't doesn't matter. Uh, so what university? Balsa uh, asked. So I go to Detroit Mercy for dental school, and he goes to Burrell College yep. uh, for for medicine in New Mexico. Yep. Oh my God, is that how it is? Yes, Rashad. Oh, Rashad came in. Rashad, I had Rashad sending some type of symbols here. Yeah, I don't $2 know. Two dollar dash six. What does that even mean? 
but whatever. What does that mean? So you're so you're launching a YouTube channel. Yeah, I am. So so these Instagram live videos, they they you can save these. Not no, Instagram Live, but no. we got Facebook Live going oh, on. So okay, okay. This will actually be posted on my on my Facebook page, okay. and I'm gonna get it from there, upload oh, it on YouTube. Sweet. Within okay. the next week, uh, the Facebook one should be uh, should be up and running. I mean, Facebook, yeah. the YouTube page should be up and yeah. running, and uh, it'll be good. We'll, there's gonna be a lot of stuff that's gonna be on that. It's gonna be how to get into dental school, tips and tricks of getting the best personal yeah. uh, letter of recommendation from. From your professors and mm -hmm. DAT thing, you name it, and then obviously stuff like this. This is stuff yeah. that I really want to keep doing more. But um, Scott one three five, uh, why do you want to be a dentist? Um, I really want to be a dentist for for multiple reasons. First, like and foremost, is I love the impact that dentistry allows you to have on on somebody's life. And what I mean by that is uh, the fact that you can really help somebody rebuild their confidence. I mean, lots of times somebody's going to come in. And um, they're going to have completely bombed out teeth or a smile that doesn't even look look that great. Mm -hmm. And the first thing you notice about somebody is their smile. It exudes confidence. It shows that, that you're a confident person. And confidence, it trickles into every other aspect of your life. I mean, if you're not uh, confident because of your smile, that can affect your relationships you have with your friends or how you perform at work mm -hmm. because it just lowers your self-esteem. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, when you're able to like help somebody uh, – by rebuilding their mouth, rebuild their confidence at the same time, I think it's it's huge the, the impact you can have in all aspects of, of somebody's life. And, and that's something I really love about dentistry. But also at the same time, uh, you get to own your own business. Mm -hmm. And medicine, I mean, you kind of see that that's starting to, to disappear. Yeah. And in dentistry, eventually, that's that's a trend that's happening as well. Mm -hmm. Like you have these big corporations um, and also through uh, people working through the government as well at these uh, health centers, these community health centers, and people are no longer really practice owners, business owners. Yeah. So that's eventually going to going to die. But at this point in time, uh, you definitely can still open up your own practice, and that's something that, that I'm really passionate about. I love uh, just having a team working together and doing all that type of stuff. So, uh, but yeah, uh, which branch of dentistry you love? I love maxillofacial surgery. So. Maxillofacial surgery, basically, mm -hmm. uh, it seems like she wants to be uh, an oral surgeon, so that's cool. Uh, I honestly, I'm not planning to pursue a specialty mm -hmm. in any way. I I think they're all unique in their in their own regards, and um, like I was talking about earlier, how uh, like perio is just super important because um, the foundation of, of your teeth. That's essentially what perio is, and maintaining that it's uh, it's a crucial thing to. To do because you look at like a house i'll give this this uh analogy again you look at a house um and how a house is built like it has wooden framework or whatever is in the middle to support the house uh to make everything to allow you to put everything uh, on the outside that looks aesthetically pleasing or on the inside when you walk around to look aesthetically uh pleasing and so everything is unique in its own in its own way from uh endodontist to perio to to oral surgery and i love the fact that as a general dentist, you get to really interact with all the different specialties of mm -hmm. dentistry and, and dabble in, in everything as well if you'd like. So, so that's pretty cool. You know, follow up on the period dentistry. Is uh, period dentistry a specialty or it's a specialty? So um, you're going to have to go to uh, a program after you graduate dental school and uh, do that for a few years and then you can become a periodontist. So. But yeah, it's uh, it's interesting, and I, I love I love learning about all the different types of specialty because they're all interconnected in, in some way, obviously. Yeah. So, and even the crazy thing is, like, there are specialties that people might not even think exist yeah. in dentistry. What are some of the specialties that, like, could you name? Yeah, so um, you obviously have the the main ones that everyone knows about: orthodontist, endodontist, yeah. um, perio oral surgery, yeah. stuff like that. But then you have things that people might not even think, like yeah. you. A specialty in dentistry is public health. Oh wow! Yeah, that, right, yeah. That's actually a specialty, and a lot of people don't think that. Or um, pathology as well. So you have all these um, really yeah, obscure yeah. things that people might not think uh, would be a specialty, but yeah, it's a specialty of, of yeah. dentistry because there's so many different. Uh, let's see what Rashad says. Terrace, what kind of medicine do you want to do? Future Lakers team doc. We missed out. We spoke about the Lakers. Yeah, Rashad, we talked about how Kobe's cool. the greatest. Like. 
So uh, you missed out on that. He actually broke it down in there in a way that just kind of blew my mind because I didn't I didn't hear it like that. Well, I had to give I had to give unique ones because the common stuff we know the unique ones. But what med what medicine do I want to do? I'm not sure. I I, I like pediatrics. Um, I I like surgery, but uh, the life the lifestyle scares me, and I don't want to give up my I don't know if I want to give up my life. And I don't know too much about it until I rotate through and I actually see what their life is like on a day to day basis. But maybe I might do you know sports medicine also. Everything everything's fun. The only things I will not do are pathology. Yeah, it's just not for me. I, I, they're very important and they're they're needed, but it's just not for me. Dermatology I couldn't do. Yeah. Um, Radiology, I couldn't do. Yeah. So those, I know radiology, pathology, and dermatology are things that I will not be doing. But other than that, I could end up in internal medicine too. I'm not going to. Yeah. So, like, so, but there's so many fields, man. There's anesthesia, there's surgery, ENT, ophthalmology. Yeah. There's like family medicine. And there's so many. What do you think of Rand Paul? I'm curious because he's he's an ophthalmologist, right? Uh -huh. You know who else is an ophthalmologist? Who? Uh, Bashar al Assad is an ophthalmologist also. I didn't know that. Yeah, there, there's a lot of like very polarizing figures who are ophthalmologists. Yeah. <laughs> what do I think of Rand Paul? Uh, uh, Rand Paul, I mean, his father, Ron Paul, I can speak more to him. Uh, he had some interesting points yeah. that I thought were very interesting. Um, but Rand Paul, I don't know enough about yeah. his body of work to yeah. really comment on him. I don't want to say anything. Cause I don't really yeah. I mean, I'm Ron sure Paul, some he's stuff. A, he's a doctor. So. Yeah, his dad was a was a doctor too. Um, yeah, that's true. Or is, or is is alive? That's true. So that's something yeah. that that super super huge though is like you have people in Congress and in the Senate. And we need more of that. Yeah, and they all had past careers, and there are, I think three or four dentists. Yeah, that's um, necessary. Man. Yeah, absolutely. Because they know what what the field is about, so they we need our people to be informing the other politicians. Yeah. So if, if that's something other than that you know you can look into and, and pursue. Why not dermatology? They have a nice lifestyle. They have a great lifestyle. Oh no, they do. I, but I it's just not for it's you, just man. not for a personality. I don't want to just uh, it's very important to like melanoma, skin cancer, you know, but I just it doesn't excite me at all. You know, and, and, and for some people it's really exciting. Some people things that I like aren't exciting and that's okay. It's my preference, you know. So let's take that one last question yeah. uh, from Memorable Moon, and then uh, we can kind of wrap it up. All right. So I guess do you want to kind of hit that for for how it is for for medicine? So it's, with student debt, it's a reality that we have to face. Once you take the loans, right, just just let it go. I mean, just let the loans are there, you know, and then just live your life because you know what's what's another five. You're taking two hundred thousand, three hundred thousand out. What's another two hundred dollars or twenty yeah. bucks, you know, to eat food or something? Don't for your own health, you know, you're taking out so much money, 100%. You, know, take, you can take another 10 bucks and eat something. Yeah. And then another thing is like when you take loans, like obviously try to get federal loans, but if you take private loans, look out for things like if, you know, God forbid you pass away or something, make sure the loan doesn't get passed on to your, your family. family. Yeah, yeah. Little, little things like that. Just look at those kind of things. And and also some loans, if, if you take the loan and you pay it back like quickly, you get like a fine or a fee for paying it back so fast. Yeah, because <laughs> so they're trying to make money out Yeah, so, so look out for loans like that. So little things like that, like, you know, it's, it's a very disgusting system. It is, it is, uh, it's, it's terrible. There's it a lot of reform that needs to be done yeah. in that. I mean, the U.S. is about $1 trillion in, it's $1 trillion of like student loan debt. Yeah. That's insane. That's, yeah. that's absolutely insane. Yeah. But um, did you guys take loans in undergrad? No, I actually didn't. I don't know. Did you? For under for undergrad, I did not. I was getting loans and funding from the father. <laughs> same here. Yeah. Same here. But yeah, dental school that's different. I'm having half a million dollars of debt when I come out. So, but I, I agree 100 percent with uh, with Harris. Uh, just live your life. Don't do like impulse purchases that are, are completely stupid. unrealistic and stupid. Don't do that, but don't limit yourself at the same time because um, you're going into a profession where you're going to be making a lot of money. And the thing is, like, if you're passionate about what it is that you're learning, uh, if you're passionate about your future uh, career, everything's going to fall into place. The money's going to fall. So don't don't worry about that. Don't buy a house right away or some brand new S, S class or something when you graduate because then that's not going to be good. But, um, yeah, so... Thanks, guys. Uh, we love doing this with you guys, answering all of your guys' questions. Um, if you guys have any other questions, go ahead and just uh, send me a message or whatever. You guys know how to find me. 
And uh, this right here is uh, Harris. Uh, you can find him on Instagram, the, uh, the Desert Doc, and uh, follow him. He's got a lot of great things to, to talk about. He's very insightful. He knows a lot about a lot of different things. Uh, just don't get guac with Chipotle. Don't go to Chipotle. Don't, don't yeah. Don't. If, if you live in <laughs> Southern California or, or Texas, like Houston or something, or Arizona, you should never go to Chipotle. Because there's real Mexican food. Yeah, come on. Real Mexican food. Yeah. Rashad, you should just delete your Instagram and go home and <laughs> lock yourself in your room in the closet and never come out. Okay, so that, that's it. It's been, it's been a pleasure, man. I'm, I'm happy that Rashad's you... Rashad's my friend, by the way. Yeah. I'm not saying anything. We love friend. Rashad. We love Rashad. We love Rashad. <laughs> All right, so you guys, uh, thanks again, and you guys have a, a great rest of your day.